Assalamu alaikum everyone. Allah bi lahi min ash-shaytan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to the first series of webinars on Islamic American heritage. Uh, this involves teaching you about the history of Islam in America. So I'm going to give you a little bit about my our plan for today. My plan is to tell you a little bit first about why I started researching this topic and why I got really into it. And then I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the topics that I could talk about further. And I'd like everybody to make notes in the comments if they want to hear more about some of these stories. Because we're going to have two more uh, webinars and I'd really like to talk about things that you're interested in. So if you could just put some of those com in the comments topics, that would be great. And I also want to encourage everyone here to take notes because uh, if you go to my website and subscribe, I will send you an email with some questions. And if you can answer those questions from your notes, I will send you a free gift. So you'll find out more about what that free gift is at the end of this to, um, webinar today. Um, so to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, I want to talk about actually giving our kids the tools to battle Islamophobia. So the first um, thing, I, I'm going to show you a picture of my son. He's um, driving a Razor, and I live in Texas. I didn't always live in Texas. I was raised in Washington, D.C. But my husband's from Texas, and we've moved to Texas. And my husband thought it would be a good idea to get my kids a Razor for uh, Eve. So for those of you who are not familiar with off-roading, razors are sort of like these four-wheel machines that you can go to like a cow pasture and for a small fee you can pay some money and get into the cow pasture and you can ride these razors across creeks and through woods and over gravel hills and it's really good guy fun. And then you can like spend the night in a trailer with the other guys. So my husband didn't have anybody to any other families to go to do this off-roading with and he went to some meetup.com and found these Hispanic truck drivers and of course they served they took turns with the meals cooking the meals and they served sausage for breakfast and they saw that none of my boys my two boys and my husband none of them were eating the, the pork so they turned to them and asked them, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And of course, my kids were kind of nervous, didn't know what to say. And they came home and told me about the, the situation. And I asked them, why don't you just ride razors with Muslims? And they said, Mom, Muslims don't like riding razors. And I started to think, why, do they, why would they think that Muslims wouldn't want to ride razors? And I really realized that just as I had thought growing up that Muslim, thought of Muslims as sort of foreign in our own American society, they still do think of Muslims as foreigners. Even when I was growing up as a kid, my mother's American, my father's Iranian, but my father's been a citizen. I was born and raised in Washington, D.C. Why should I not consider myself a, an American? But I would refer to non-Muslims, my other word, rather than saying non-Muslims, I would call them Americans. Americans do this, Americans do that. I really meant non-Muslims, but I would refer to them as Americans. And I, was, I think back now, and I think, why didn't I feel like I had the right to call myself an American and actually feel proud and patriotic even at that of, for my American citizenship? So I, did, I decided at that point that I really need to teach my children that it is that Americans can be proud to be American. Muslims can be proud to be Americans. And I tried to figure out how to do this. Well, they went to middle school and the Trump was, you know, and there was a Trump election a campaign going on. And uh, there was all kinds of negative propaganda going on about Muslims. And my both they were, they were in sixth and eighth grade. Well, at that time, the kids thought it was funny, middle school boys thought it was funny to make their fingers like guns and say, Allah Akbar, every time they saw my sons. So my kids came home and they told me about it, and I asked other Muslim 
kids who go to that public school and they said yes they see that as well happening and so I decided to ask these parents hey will you go with me to the principal and tell the, the principal this is not right and they all said no 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 we don't want to be involved and I said well okay I'm gonna do this alone and I went to the principal and she said absolutely this is wrong and I said but wait a minute I don't want a witch hunt I don't want you to go find that kid and punish that kid all that kid is doing is mimicking what's online I want you to educate the teachers because this is happening right in front of the teachers I want you to tell the teachers teach them that this is not right teach them what Allah Akbar means and why this is sort of derogatory against Muslims but of course she made us witch hunt out of it my kids got embarrassed so I said okay I have to take a different approach so this time I thought let me go on the internet because my kids said mom you can't do anything about it they're all memes it's all on the internet you, if I even have tell if I tell my teacher what good does it do it's all over the internet so I tried to look for ways to take down things from the internet and it's like virtually impossible to take things down from the internet you can write tons of emails and gather lots of petitions and things but you'll waste your time and it'll take forever so meanwhile at th that time I had gone to a uh, technology conference for my work and they were teaching teachers I'm a teacher how to create how to get your children involved with technology in your education um, so in your instruction so he the the presenter said he also experienced this problem of people posting negative things on the internet and he gave an example that once he um, he, he had somebody posting on Twitter negative things about him while he was presenting to some high schoolers and he ignored all of those negative comments eventually one person wrote something positive and he called that kid out in the audience and had the whole audience applaud for that child and that that caused a bunch of other children in the audience to also post positive comments and eventually with all the positive comments that were posted the negative ones were drowned out so we can do that as well if we just encourage our kids to make a positive meme about Muslims and just share it on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram snapchat whatever you guys have um, that would be great all right so uh, we all have our different ways of dealing with Islamophobia but I want everybody to sort of change their mindset of thinking about Islamophobia as our children being victimized and instead give our children the tools they can use to combat Islamophobia and so the different mindset that I want you to think about is actually teaching them Islamic heritage Islamic American heritage that is teaching them that Islam is part of American history it is ingrained into every part of American history from the time that America America was discovered to the time that it was established to the time of the, any of its wars the Civil War until the present day anything that you study in American history can somehow be connected to Islam and Muslims so how do we teach Islamic American heritage well first of all we got to reteach history so um, when you reteach history you got to look at the way history is being taught right now heritage American heritage is basically teaching that um, um, Americans came here on the Mayflower's pilgrims now they might get into teaching about slaves coming here on slave ships against their will or they might teach about immigrants coming here for a better life but who are the heroes in the story that your children learn at school the heroes are the pilgrims that come over on the Mayflower and they need to start diversifying their education to include several other ways that people came to America this was not the only people that these were not the only people that came to America and established this country so we really have to reteach history go to the next slide please thank you so how can we teach Islamic American heritage we can look at legends there's all kinds of legends um, that that people tell oral history that people tell that a lot of times come from Muslims Br'er Rabbit and the Tar Baby that's a good example of a story that comes from Muslim slaves 
So that, that's a legend, the legend of Queen Calafia in California, the, what California is named after is a legend that has to do with Muslims. We can look at our own ancestors as a second way. Uh, and I'm gonna show you the genealogical research of my own um, mother's side, who's the American European side, and show you how she has Muslims in her heritage. So you, you may think that you don't have, Americans don't have Muslims in their heritage, but a lot of times they do. We can look at what our founding fathers said about Muslims. And Thomas Jefferson actually encouraged everybody to actually even consider Muslims when he was passing the Freedom of Religion Act. And there's several um, things that you can look at about what Benjamin Franklin studied, for example, that he quoted Sira exactly when there is no Sira available in English. So there are several resources you can look at for for founding fathers and what they thought about Muslims and how they thought that they Muslims need to be included in American society and as citizens. You can also look at our cultural experiences. For example, the fact that my son is Muslim and he shares a cultural experience of riding a razor like other Americans enjoy. If you share a common experience with other Americans, that also can teach you about your American heritage. And then you can also look at heroes and people who contributed to American culture, and that can also teach you about American heritage. So it's anything that we can connect to. So I just wanna give you some brief, I've kind of touched on some stories that I could go deeper into. And again, just make comments in the, in the uh, comment page. Um, on this slide, you'll see um, I have a picture, I had somebody illustrate uh, of Queen Calafia. California, California was named after Queen Calafia, a caliph is a Muslim leader, and Calif Calif California was named after Queen Calafia, a woman leader who was in California before Columbus came. Uh, you can see the University of Alabama symbol. That's because University of Alabama was burned to the ground, and when it was burned to the ground, only one book was saved. That one book was the Quran. You can see Orphan Annie, Orphan Annie was from the Ben Ishmael, or the character she's based on, was from the Ben Ishmael tribe. And that tribe was believed to be a group of Muslims who were, who the state of Indiana actually used eugenics to erase that tribe from that town. And she was one of the orphans. They, they put the children up for adoption. So, um, she could have been a Muslim. Uh, the person who discovered New Mexico, Estevanico, is credited on the New Mexico website as being Muslim. Uh, the Statue of Liberty was actually originally a woman with a hijab. Uh, Thomas Jefferson had a Quran, and Benjamin Franklin actually began with his last published letter with the words Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And the way we spread, we, we were able to create the um, cross-continental railroad was we had to have surveyors go through areas that were not charted. Mm -hmm. And we had a camel core that High Jolly was a Muslim. He, he, was, he came here in order to survey the land between Texas and California, Arizona, New Mexico, and he brought camels. He's documented to be a Muslim. Several of the um, things that led to the Civil War, that when they were trying to end slavery, were Islam was used to uh, show why slavery was bad. So there was a, a, the bottom picture, you'll see there's a, the caning of Charles Sumner, and he actually quoted Quran on the floor of the Congress. That actually led to the Civil War because it ins he insulted the Southerners by saying that Muslims were more, had more humanistic and civil practices than the Southerners who were having slavery. He got caned on the floor. He got injured on the floor of the Senate because of this. It's a very iconic American symbol that led to the Civil War. Um, you may have heard, and, and then, you know, at the top, there's Melungeons. You've got Elvis Presley, Tom Hanks, and 
Abraham Lincoln, well, what did they have to do with Muslims? Well, there's these people called the Melungeons that live in the Appalachian, and it's believed that they are descendant from Muslims. So you've got all kinds of stories. You can go to the next slide, and there's even more stories I can share. And these kind of show how the Islam has come into American culture. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote a book called Dread about slaves who lived in the swamps. And the particular slave that she based her story off of, a man named Osman, Br'er Rabbit and the Tar Baby, I mentioned that, the Gullah uh, Geechee um, people of the Barrier Islands in Georgia is another good story. The first Iftar by Thomas Jefferson and Monticello, great story. The first person to ever, that we know of, that ever discovered America, 1889, Kashkash Kash ibn Said. Eight, 889, hundreds of years before Columbus. The king in Mali, Mansu Abu Bakr, 1311, came here with 2,000 ships. Not three like Columbus. Columbus had three ships. He had 2,000. This is all documented very well in history. So we need to teach our kids that Columbus is not the first one to come to America. Muslims were among those that did come to America before Columbus. All right, so now I wanted to take you into uh, my Muslim heritage, and I'm gonna show you that my mother's side is very European, does have um, Muslims in her American heritage, Muslim in her heritage. So the first picture is, you'll see, that symbol of the grave with a, with a question mark is a website that you can go to called Find a Grave, and this is how my mother did her research. Find a Grave allows you to actually take a post and um, you could make a whole virtual web, a whole virtual grave for that person. So in other words, you can leave virtual flowers. You can connect that page with another page of somebody else who, like maybe the mother or the father or the children. And people volunteer to go to graveyards and take pictures and post them and connect them to their relatives. And then other people just go to the website to visit their relatives on the graves and leave virtual flowers or notes or stories about them. So it's a way to bring back, um, sort of bring, bring those people sort of alive again. And <clears throat> this is a picture of my family from probably 1980 or 1979. This is my dad's Iranian, my mom's American, and then my, me and my little brother. I had a Photoshop scarf in there because I wasn't wearing hijab at the time. Um, then the next screen is a picture of, of my mother. And uh, her name's Arlene Sprague Patero. And the next screen is a picture of my grandfather, Francis William Sprague. And remember how I was saying you can actually learn about history through your ancestry? Well, my grandfather sold flowers to the to the Woolworths that had the civil rights movement the uh, where they had the sit-in so from his life you can learn about the civil rights movement okay the next screen his father was Frank Azar Sprague and from his heritage from his story you can learn of, about uh, agricultural revolution because he actually engineered the navy bean to make it to make it one of the most fruitful crops in Michigan, and people didn't worry about starving after that. So from his story, his life, you can learn about the agricultural revolution. Now his father, Ezra Sprague, was uh, the third settler of Montana. And from his life, you could learn about the frontiersmen and the Western movement. All of this is American history. Now his father was as was Edward Sprague, and he's actually he actually uh, is buried in Canada, and he has the picture of the one finger in the symbol. I'm going to get back to that, but this is an Islamic symbol according to Amir Muhammad, who's a researcher at the uh, Islamic American Heritage Museum. And then the next two, three people are Caleb Sprague, Thomas Sprague, and Edward Sprague. And if you look very closely at Thomas Sprague's uh, grave, you can see a picture of a Kaaba at the top of it, top of Edward Sprague. Now I have no evidence that Edward Sprague was a Muslim, 
but I do have evidence that he was descended from a Muslim. I have no evidence that he practiced Islam, but I have suspicion that they continued the teaching of Tawheed. And to me, a person who, who believes in Tawheed, that is enough to say that they are a Muslim because the definition of a Muslim is la ilaha illallah, Muhammad and Rasulullah. So we may have had many Americans in, Amer in the US who believed in ta the Tawheed, by definition making them Muslim, but who could not practice Islam because they did not have religious freedom at the time. During, this, during the colonial days, if you did not pay a fine to the church, you I made mean, a tax to the church, you were fined. So there was really a lot of times no way to practice Islam during the colonial days. Now, if you go to Edward Sprague's parents, her mother was Abigail Southern Sprague, and I don't have a picture of her, but she would have looked something like this picture. And then her mother uh, was Annika Von Sele Southard, and again, I don't have a picture of her, but she would have looked something like the girl with one pearl earring. So then you can go to, um, and her father is Anthony Von Sele, and her, his father was Jan Jansoon Von Sele. Now, Anthony Von Sele is considered by any hysteria, historian you can look at as one of the original settlers of Brooklyn, New York may have been the first person of the colonies to have lived in Brooklyn, New York. So where did Anthony Von Sele come from and how did he come to live in Manhattan or Brooklyn? Well, his father was what you would call a privateer, a corsair, or in, to what most people would think of as pirates. Um, but there's a little bit of difference between each of these. A corsair is a Muslim pirate and a private, privateer or a corsair are both paid money by a foreign government to actually harass ships. So this was a common practice at the time. Now if you say someone's a pirate, this is against international laws, but at that time all wars were fought through this style of harassing ships. And he was not the only Muslim pirate. There were several pirates that converted to Islam, European pirates that converted to Islam. So, um, let me tell you a little bit about some of the, let me see. Yeah, so the European privateers that converted to Islam, the Kosiris, I think you need to switch the screen. Um, there was Uluj Ali, his name was Giovanni Dion, G, Dian, Dianigi. He was actually Italian. He converted to Islam in the, about the 1600s. There was Suleiman Rais. His the, another name for him was Ivan D. Ivan D. Wienboer. He was also Dutch. He was actually a friend of Jan Jansoon, my ancestor. And then there's Yusuf Rais, who you may know of as Jack Ward or Jack Birdie, or Jack Sparrow. He was the uh, character in Pirates of the Caribbean. So like, pretty much half of the cast in Pirates of the Caribbean were probably Muslims. Some of them were actually Ottomans, and some of them were actually European converts. And they actually had this term during the 1600s of turned Turk. That means they went to the Ottoman side and became Muslim. And there's a lot of incentives for joining a pirate crew. Once you join a pirate crew, everybody had equality on the ship. There was democracy and there was a um, there was there was a democracy and there was a whole set of laws for each ship. So you didn't have to follow the church in England. The Church of England was no longer ruling you or the church of whatever country you were at. You could have freedom from from that church. So a lot of people did like that independence and they joined the, the ships for that reason. So um, Jan Jansoon, he was a pirate. He actually was not just himself a Muslim. He had a huge crew and he convinced most of his crew to convert to Islam. 
And he actually established, he had convinced enough people to convert to Islam that he established a country in Morocco called Saleh. And Saleh was opposite of Rabat in that same port. And he became the president of this small country. If you look up um, the Sally Raiders, the, you'll see some schools like use that as their mascot. There's a group of what Americans would call pirates um, that raided um, our, our, our harassed ships. And they were under him, under uh, Jan Jan Soon Bon Saleh. So Jan Jan Soon, he left his Dutch family. He, had, he was married, he had uh, ch three children. He left them and he married a Morisco woman. Now Moriscos are people from Spain who were kicked out of Spain because they wanted to be Muslim during the Inquisition. So with the Inquisition, if you learn about the Inquisition, you can learn a lot about how, um, about, a lot about Muslims in European history. M Muslims became slaves in the galleys, Muslims were became slaves on ships, so and they were used as bartering tools during wars. So there's all kinds of things that you could learn about Muslims in his in European history um, if you learn about the Inquisition. Um, so next we're going to go to what what was New Amsterdam like? So New Amsterdam is the first European colony that was successful in America. Of course, they're speaking Dutch. It wasn't, the British were not the first. The British tried, but they weren't successful. The, the Dutch were actually the first. And the reason they came here was to hunt furs. And they had a trading, um, they traded furs for money. And of course, there's one guy, Hudson, who decided he wanted to try to find out if he could go through the Great Lakes and find a way through to the other side of the continent. But then he found out that that wasn't possible. But the, you know, the Lake Hudson is named after him. So um, when they first established the colony, it was established with under the pretense of freedom of religion. Now the Dutch were very supportive of freedom of religion because their enemy were the Spaniards. The Spaniards were not for freedom of religion. They wanted to, they, they started the Inquisition and the Dutch were, were Protestants and they accepted even Jews and Quakers to live in Holland. So they, had, they were one of the first civilizations to actually start to develop this idea in Europe to develop this idea of freedom of religion. And when they set up New Amsterdam, they said in the charter, we welcome Turks and Egyptians, meaning Muslims. They wanted to show that, they, and my ancestor was, they would have considered him a Turk, even though he's half Dutch. So he has every right to believe that he should be able to live in New Amsterdam, because first of all, he's half Dutch. His father is Dutch. He should have Dutch citizenship. And second of all, because it, the charter said it welcomed Christ, uh, Turks and Egyptians. So when they set up New Amsterdam, there wasn't a lot of law and order because they didn't want the church to be in charge. However, after some time, it sort of became just orderly in New Amsterdam. Um, people loitered and um, stole and the, they argued about boundaries of property and all kinds of things. So governor, the governor of New Amsterdam, he decided that we really need to put some laws in place here. And the only way they knew how to do that was through a church. They didn't have sort of policemen and all that thing. The, all, all the courts were through the church. They didn't know any other way to do this. So they put the church back in charge. The Dutch church was in charge of New Amsterdam. And when they did that, they had to ask for, for taxes from uh, all the residents. Now there are only about 300 families that live there, maybe 2,000 people. So there's very few people and they need to get the taxes from them. And my ancestor, Anthony Van Sele, refused to pay the taxes to pay the pastor's salary. When they would come and knock on his door and say, hey, you got to pay the pastor's salary, he would have a few choice words for them. And then he would get fined for slander. So in the church, they set up 
court cases. And there were probably about 40 court cases, and about 14 of them were for my ancestor, Anthony Bonsalé. So each time he's going to this court case, we've got a new documentation of something that he's being sort of picked on about or bullied about. Uh, so the things he was charged for, one, like I said, was not paying the pastor's salary. Another one was um, the slander. Another one was the neighbors would accuse him of sending their, his dogs to kill their pigs. Um, another one was that um, at one time he married his daughter to a neighbor. Well, the agreement was that the dowry would be 20 cows. Now you really have to think about this. Why is this a problem? A Muslim agrees with a European that the dowry will be 20 cows. He's marrying his daughter. Think about this. Because the dowry for a Muslim, the gift goes from the husband to the wife. The dowry, definition of dowry for a European, the gift goes from the father of the bride to the groom. So they get married. They agree. Dowry's 20 cows. Yes, we all agree. Get married. Yay, everything's fine. But then where are the 20 cows? You're supposed to give me the 20 cows. No. You're, I'm not going to give you any twig cows. You're supposed to give those to my daughter. You know, so of course there's an argument, so they take it to court, and they, they say, you know, you have to obey our laws. And Anthony Von Sille says, the only laws I have to obey is Allah's laws. And they said, okay, well, you can't live here. If you don't want to obey our laws, you can't live here. So he gets banished from New Amsterdam. And they say, you have to leave, go to Morocco or Holland or wherever you have to go, but you have to leave New Amsterdam. So he appeals the case and they take it to the king in Holland and the king says, well, look, he doesn't have to leave that whole area. Give him 200 acres just outside of New Amsterdam. When you just go just outside of New Amsterdam, you go across the East River and you get to Brooklyn, New York. Well, it wasn't called Brooklyn then. Um, and so he was granted, he was the first person to be granted 200 acres in what is now Gravesend, if you go to Gravesend, New York. And that's just north of Coney Island. Well, Coney Island used to be called Turk Island after him. And so you've got Turk Island and you've got Governor's Island. So those were the two enemies uh, uh, in New Amsterdam. And Anthony Von Salle in Gravesend actually had a, his first neighbor was a lady named Lady Moody. Well, Lady Moody was the first person to establish the borough of, of uh, Brooklyn. So she established Brooklyn. And that was his neighbor. They were friendly, but his Lady Moody's husband was not friendly with, with Anthony Von Sille. So he, Anthony Von Sille was not the only Muslim that lived in New Amsterdam. His brother Abraham also lived in New Amsterdam. They, Anthony von Sille immersed himself into the Dutch, the white Dutch culture. He became an investor. He owned lots of land. He, when he first moved to New Amsterdam, he owned a farm in southern Manhattan on what is now where, where Wall Street is right now. And um, so he, he just, he had a lot of money to invest in that whole area. People knew him as having, being a very good investor there. His brother, on the other hand, immersed himself as a slave with the slaves. And he had a slave wife and had a child with the slave. He left a will to that slave. So um, you can see in the pictures that I have, the slides, you can see the pictures of what New Amsterdam looked like. And then you can also see the pictures of the Dutch church and um, the um, governor, I, can't, I can never say his name correctly, Peter Stuvient something like that. All right, so from, from these, from Anthony Von Sille, there are probably a million descendants if you count them. And my mom's one of them. Uh, but among some of the others are Warren Harding, the President of the United States, Cornelius Vanderbilt, Tycoon, uh, Jackie Onassis, um, and then even Anderson Cooper is a descendant of Anthony Von Sille. So 
if you go back far enough into American heritage, you sometimes can find um, a, lot, a lot of Islamic American heritage. So all of this, this, this is just my story, and I wanted to share all of this with everybody. And I, I want you to realize that all of you can support teaching American heritage. And how can you do that? Well, first way is, of course, by supporting the resolution 869 that has been uh, a campaign by the uh, ICNA Council for Social Justice. And that resolution says that Americans support uh, the contributions of Muslims in history, American history. And they have several uh, called call posters or memes on the internet that you can just share, just like a meme campaign. And um, just share those with everybody. And one of those that I picked out was by Robert Dickinson Crane, because I felt like he was a lot like my mother. He's a white American guy who just happened to research his genealogy. And it's like, whoa, there's Muslims in my genealogy. His Muslim heritage, actually, Amer Muslim American heritage, involves Native Americans. So uh, you can look more at that. And then another thing you can do to promote Islamic American heritage education is to actually celebrate Islamic American Heritage Month. They do have this in Canada, and some mosques in, I think, the East Coast um, do celebrate this. They take October, and they just have kids do projects on famous Muslim Americans. Each one maybe makes a poster or a display, and then invites people from the community around the mosque in and to, to see these posters or um, displays about famous uh, Muslim Americans in history. So you could do that. Uh, you could teach that in your Sunday school. Um, also, I am writing a book, or I have written a book, an, a textbook. Like we have, there are books out there about Islamic American heritage and history, but none of them are textbooks. They aren't ready for, they don't have activities and questions and they are organized with vocabulary words and all that sort of thing for, for kids in Sunday schools. And many of us do not have our Sunday school set up to teach Islamic American heritage, and we've got to do that. We've got to go to each one of our schools and make sure you look at your curriculum and make sure you have at least some part of your curriculum addressing Islamic American heritage. You, my textbook is all about Islamic American heritage. It starts with the explorers and discoverers before Columbus and after Columbus, and then it goes into our founding fathers and what they believed, the slaves. Uh, it goes into um, things that led to the Civil War and also um, I like to call them centennial Muslims. So this is the um, millennial age that was the centennial age, you know. So centennial Muslims as well. And we could teach all our kids the, and give them the tools so that when somebody says, where are you from, they can say, I'm American and be proud of it. They can listen to the national anthem and feel a sense of pride and patriotism that any other American feels and feel every right to feel that. And if we don't teach our kids patriotism and American heritage, this will be a big problem because you're teaching them that they don't belong in a place that is the only place they have ever known. Now, my father is Iranian. Do I feel like I belong in Iran? Absolutely not. I was raised here. I am an American. I need to feel like I belong here, and so do our kids. So this is why this is so important. Um, I can open it for questions now if you have any questions. Um, I, I didn't know how long it would take for me to, to get through all of this. Uh, so go ahead, and, and, and uh, if you have any questions, we can... There's the one comment on, the, on the Facebook, the Brian Smith. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of if any of the Spanish settlers in uh, St. Augustine, Florida in the 1580s were Muslim? Okay, this is actually another descendant. Brian Smith is a descendant of Anthony Van Sillet as well. Ah. We are friends on Facebook. Um, so St. Augustine, uh, I'm thinking he's talking about La Florida. If you look at uh, the heritage of the Cher Cherokee Indians, they would call them Cherokee Indians. 
but actually, for example, Robert Dickinson Crane, he, he says he has uh, Cherokee heritage. He will tell you that his ancestors actually called the Azan and made a sort of a, a hedge, even though they couldn't go to Mecca, they, they had a, a pilgrimage that they did that they called hedge. And there also the Cherokees wear a turban and they have several teachings that are very Islamic. So what I could find out is that those Spaniards, when they escaped from those ships, they are from that, um, when they were under the Spaniards and they escaped, that they had gone and intermarried with the Native Americans, especially the Cherokees. That's the best I could find. Um, there are some Muslims, some, some Cherokees and some Native Americans with Muslim names. Whether or not they practiced Islam, we don't know. There was a, a, um, a Mohican actually, it's not a Cherokee, but a Mohican named Muhammad Wynonaman, and he actually went to England to petition the, the queen to ask them to stop taking the lands of the Native Americans. There was another Native American who actually, I think that one was Cherokee, um, Wati, I think was his name. And I'm, I'm talking off the top of my head because I, I don't have everything in front of me, but he, he fought in the Confederate Army, actually, during the Civil War. Um, and his son um, had a Muslim name. So I think it was Suleiman. So um, there, there, are, there are lots of hints of Muslims being in the Cherokee and Native American, uh, being, being, having married among them and living among them. And if you think about it, what, one thing you have to understand with American her heritage and history is that race was a lot more of a big deal than, than it is now because we have integration now. But the thing you should also, as you should understand is we didn't just have blacks and whites. There was lots of in-betweens. So there weren't just black schools and white schools. There were black schools, white schools, and Turk schools. And the Turks would not go to black schools, and the Turks and the white, they couldn't come to white schools. So they, they were actually Turk schools. They were considered a whole race of, and these races looked like mixed races. They call them tri- racial they they were all mixed some in one family you might see somebody that looks kind of african and somebody that looks more like a pakistani and somebody that looks more like a native american indian but they were all mixed up into one family they couldn't intermarry with other people because whites had to marry whites blacks had to marry blacks even when it came down to citizenship and the census there were all kinds of arguments of what kind of, what are these people are they blacks are they whites what are they and they had put mulatto they put turk they, they had they had the free people of color. They didn't know what to call them. And those people were isolated just as black people were because they couldn't intermarry with, or they couldn't, um, they couldn't integrate their schools and things with whites. So we have to have kind of an open, mi open mind about the way we look at the races in the history of America. That answer that question. I hope. Okay. All right. One more question. Is, do I have any questions? Uh -huh. the, what other uh, topics you will be covering in your in your next two webinars? Well, that's why I want everybody to kind of contribute mm -hmm. in the comment section. What do they want to learn about? Do they like the Statue of Liberty story? Do they like the University of Alabama story? Do they like to learn about? Well, there. I didn't touch on. Um, some Pakistani children will come to me sometimes and say, what about us? You talked about Sp Spaniards and Dutch and, and Moroccans. And so they really relate to the Pakistani kids coming and like, what about us? What, you know, have, are, you know, the Pakistanis just come to America recently? What, what is our heritage in Islam in America? Well, they have to know about the tamale vendors. The tamale vendors dominated the, West, the Northwest. So, um, uh, they are Afghan Pakistanis who came in the 1900s. They were actually trying to escape slavery in the Caribbean. And they came to America where everybody else was going west. They were going east. So they were landing in, from, in boats in Seattle and selling tamales all along the, from the, north, all along the northwest. They're, they're in places like North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming. 
A guy named Zaref Khan was the first person to have a halal restaurant in a place called Sheridan, Wyoming. And in Sheridan, Wyoming, you can go to the website, Sheridan, Wyoming, and they're actually building a statue to honor him, Zaref Khan. And you can donate money to their cause of building the statue. I think it'd be great if Muslims could donate money to building this statue for, for Sheridan, Wyoming, you know? Yeah, so th that's a great story. Um, of course, now we're finding out more and more about W.D. Muhammad, or no, yeah, not W.D., W.D. Fard, who was a tamale vendor uh, through, because of released FBI files. Um, that's a great story. There, there's all kinds, the High Jolly and all of the legends that are told about the camels, the feral camels that were roaming in Arizona and Texas because High Jolly left them and you know let them go into the, the deserts there. Those are great American stories. There's even there are even folk tales about High Jolly's camels that you can hear. So these are iconically American things that we can hang on to that 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 show that America influenced our culture. I mean, Muslims influenced American culture. Um, there was another question by Brian. He's asking, uh, do you know what date was the first Islamic mosque in the United States established? Well, there's all kinds of definitions of first mosque. You can have first purpose-built mosque, first freestanding mosque, like it was built to be a mosque. Um, and then there are mosques that don't exist anymore so you have the first mosque that's still standing <laughs> or the first mosque that was ever built but maybe it's not standing anymore um that that is in my book in the last chapter if you give me a second i can look it up um, but what's kind of known as being the first mosque is um the mother mosque it's called uh it's in iowa that's what i want to say iowa. yes iowa uh cedar rapids iowa Cedar Rapids, Iowa is often credited for being the first freestanding mosque that still exists today. And that from that is where you get um, the guy who went to World War II and said, I want my, he t wrote a letter to Eisenhower to say his dog tags, wanted, he wanted to put Muslim on his dog tag for his religion. That was um, Ingram, Ingram, Abdullah Ingram, 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 Ingram. He was from that mosque and Midamar meets all Muslims know about Midamar meats so are like sold all over and you know get halal meat bologna and you know pastrami or whatever he, that the guy who started Midamar meats he's also from that mosque so that mosque was established in uh, Iowa around 1885 but there are evidence of mosques that were before that for example in Ross North Dakota there was a mosque um, in, built uh, before this mosque, but it's not really standing. It's not really a mosque anymore. It's kind of like they've they've rebuilt it on this farmland just as a sort of a memorial to the people who who live there. Um, and there, there are um, there's something in I think one of the I think it's the New York Times. I think there's a story about about that. Um, Albanians in Maine had some first mosques, and of course Michigan at some of the first mosques. Um, so that's when Ford brought a lot of Syrian and Lebanese Muslims to Michigan to help build the first Model T cars. So that, that's also a location. And you can also consider uh, some of the, the, although they're not Orthodox Muslims, but they were considered mosques, the, um, the more science temple kind of led to the first um, Nation of Islam mosques, which led to some more Orthodox mosques by now, by this time. So several different communities with different kinds of backgrounds, whether they were immigrants or they were um, part of the, the uh, Nation of Islam or the more science temple from the beginning. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I want you to go to my website, and I have a um, the slide. It's www.islamicschoolresources. What I do is I do free consulting for anybody who has a Muslim school or a Islamic weekend school, private school. 
and uh, you can ask for a free consultation. And then um, I have materials available. I'll have this book available, mm -hmm. and then I'll also, I have some preschool books available, and I can help you develop mm -hmm. your curriculum if you want. I have teacher trainings on there. Uh, and the books that I'm making, I'm trying not to just make the book and sell it. I want to give you lots of other tools to go with the book. So like when I publish this textbook, you can go on that website and you'll see, for example, if I'm talking about Muslims in the colonial days, you'll have books there that you can read that go along with that topic or videos you can watch that go along with that topic. So if you want to learn a little bit more about each topic, you could learn a little bit more by going to the website. I also have a blog. I didn't put that on there, but it's just Nazi Paderov at I'm sorry, nazipratov.wordpress.com. And I tried to put stories. Sometimes the stories are from my book. Sometimes they're stories I didn't get in my book. Uh, but if you ever have an interesting story and you want me to share it on my blog, I, I could do that as well. Uh, but if you subscribe on my, my website, islamicschoolresources.com, um, I will, and you can answer a few questions about this webinar, I will send you a free copy of each of the history books that I publish. So hopefully that'll motivate everybody to, to go to my website. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. All right. It was nice talking to everybody. <laughs>